Hello there, listeners. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Here's a new Rick Thompson report in which I talk to my dad about uh, things like Brexit and also the weather and some premiership football. It's been a while since the last one of these. So here you go. Here's a new one. Before we get started properly, uh, I'd like to just uh, remind you that uh, if you're in London, then why not come to the London meetup, uh, which is happening on the uh, 17th, Sunday, the 17th of November from 2 p.m. at the uh, Fitzroy Tavern Pub. I'm just getting the address here. Fitzroy Tavern Pub, which is in sort of central London, not far from Oxford Street, 16 Charlotte Street, London, W1T2LY. I'll be there. Uh, with Zdenek Lukas from Zdenek's English Podcast and various other Lepsters. Uh, we'll be just chatting in English, just for fun, maybe playing some board games, and so you can come if you like. It would be good if you could send an email to Zdenek just to let him know that you're coming. Uh, so just write to uh, teacherzdenek at gmail.com. Teacher and then Z-D-E-N-E-K at gmail.com. Just like, hi, Zdenek, I'm going to come to the meetup. I'm looking forward to it. Here's my name. See you on Sunday. Okay, all right, cool. The other thing is also the podcast is supported by sponsors, and uh, I'd like to tell you about italki because I'm sure many of you out there uh, want to improve your English, you want to improve your speaking, you want to work on your pronunciation, your fluency, maybe your grammatical accuracy or your range of vocab. Uh, you also would love to just have regular conversations in English because you know this is a vital part of improving your English, and it's much easier to do that now than it used to be uh, with services like italki. Basically, they've got loads of teachers. You go on, you can find out all the information you need about them. Uh, You can see little introductory videos. You can schedule trial, like cheaper Uh, trial lessons with them. When you find someone you like, uh, it's very easy to organize um, like a schedule of lessons. It's all done from the comfort of your own home. And when you buy some talking time, uh, italki will send you a voucher for a free lesson. To get the offer, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk or click an italki logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. This is the Rick Thompson Report with Rick Thompson. Hello, Dad. Welcome back onto the podcast. Hello, Luke. It's nice to be back. How are you today? I'm okay, thank you very much. It's a bit chilly. I'm, uh, I've got my uh, body warmer on. Yeah, your Uniqlo is coming. Uniqlo uh, body warmer thing. Very nice, filled with uh, feathers. So it, it's very light and it's very warm. Unintentional plug there for for the Japanese clothing uh, retailer, but oh, uh, Uniqlo. Yes, Uniqlo. other retailers do offer garments as well. That's right. Okay, so this is an episode of the Rick Thompson Report. What do we normally do in these episodes? Normally start with the weather report. That's right. There's been a lot of weather recently <laughs> all over all over the world. I mean we've at the moment we've got uh, raging bushfires in Australia mm. uh, and also in California. But here it's rain 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 and it, it it's been flooding areas not far away from here in the middle of the country just a bit further north in Yorkshire, Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, Nottinghamshire. They're having some horrible floods and there's more rain to come. I'm getting a sense of deja vu here. I'm sure that we've we've done this before where we've done a Rick Thompson report and the first weather report has been about flooding in parts of the country. Maybe you're causing it every time you... you <laughs> are floods. Mm. Anyway, uh, it, here in, in uh, where I am in the middle of the country, we're all right. Um, it, it, the, the River Avon, which goes through Stratford-upon-Avon and passes by not far away, is, is very high and brown and running fast, but it hasn't actually flooded. Okay. But that's been sort of a national emergency in some cases, hasn't it, the, the flooding? Yes, in areas that have been uh, completely flooded out. I mean, 400 people have, have been flooded out of their homes. It must be awful, mustn't it, just to have muddy water... Yeah, yeah, all through your house, ruining everything you've got. Awful. Does this mm. is this happening? I mean, does this always happen? Is this has this always been a feature of British life? It's getting worse. Uh, the um, you know people obviously point to climate change. I think it's now 
generally accepted that the you know the climate is changing um it took a little while for people to acknowledge it but uh, i think everybody now agrees since like what the last 10 hottest years in the planet ever recorded have happened in the last 11 years or something so i don't think anybody can deny it's getting warmer and uh, the experts say that it'll produce more um, extreme weather conditions here in the uk if people are interested in this um, we're particularly affected by what's called the jet stream. Mm -hmm. uh, some of your listeners will know about the jet stream. It's a very high altitude airflow. As the world spins, it, it, it brings weather with it, affects the weather a lot, and it swings in a kind of uh, curly way around the earth. And it comes across the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean towards our west coast. And if it's in the if it's in wrong position, it brings lots and lots of low pressure systems across uh, across britain and that brings rain so at the moment the jet stream is in that position where just successive rain belts are coming across uh, and it happening more frequently the the jet stream is being affected by the gradual change in the climate and uh, it's one of the reasons why we'll get more extreme weather so global warming in the uk might well mean mean global wetting right interesting the way the, the sort of cause and effect um, mm. brings about situations that you wouldn't expect with the with the word global warming you expect everything to dry out but it's not like that is it no okay so the last time we spoke about brexit though which is the topic that we usually deal with um that was early august episode 607 boris johnson had recently become the prime minister and was going to negotiate a new brexit deal after Theresa May had failed to get Parliament to accept the deal that she spent over two years to get. So Brexit at that time was due to happen uh, on the 31st of October. So I basically have just one question to ask you, which is just what's going on or, or maybe what's been going on? Ag. <laughs> um, well, yes, there's been a lot going on. Yes, your, your summary is right. And when we last spoke, uh, I was uh, rather suggesting that um, Boris Johnson was in no position to negotiate a better deal than Theresa May's. And therefore, I rather feared that we were plunging towards leaving the EU on the 31st of October without a deal, uh, which would be very bad news for all sorts of reasons, um, not least in in Northern Ireland, where nobody knows what to do about the border situation, and it might lead to uh, a revival of the IRA. Um, well, Boris did get a deal mm. at the last minute and came back, uh, or his people came back and said, you know, we have a great deal. It's much better than Theresa May's deal and so on and so on. Actually, all the commentators could hardly believe it, really, because mm. the deal is almost identical to um, Theresa May's deal. And uh -huh. the only differences are that uh, the big issue of the Northern Ireland border was kind of fudged. Um, it, it, fudge. it was even worse. Fudge, it means not really sorted out. It's kind of like a fudge, usually in reference to sort of political decisions or agreements, means a, a kind of badly cobbled together or a messy agreement uh, in which none of the issues are properly sorted out. So yes. some sort of political agreement that's not really going to work and it's a bit Very of a mess. Very imprecise and probably won't work. A fudge. And, uh, Yes. So, um, but uh, he's, he managed to get the EU to, um, to sort of say, okay, we, we can, we can adjust this agreement. It, it is the called the withdrawal agreement. And it's just the first stage. Mm. I mean, this Brexit process has been going on for three and a half years. And, and uh, we're still talking about the first stage, which is the agreement on which terms we actually leave the EU. It involves paying the money we owe, uh, and it involves a political declaration, which is non-binding, which says where we would expect to try to negotiate a, a, a new relationship, a trading relationship as much mm. as anything else, with the other uh, 28 member states 
And it would also have a transition period, which is what Theresa May negotiated. So basically everything would stay the same for 21 months Mm -hmm. while the next phase was negotiated, our new trade deal with the EU countries. So Boris Johnson basically reheated Theresa May's deal, which he'd much derided. Yeah. And the EU were, were, were quite happy to grant yet another extension. Very interesting that Boris Johnson had said we would leave on October the 31st, uh, come what may, <laughs> do or die. He said, I'd rather be dead in a ditch than ask for another extension. I'd rather be dead in a ditch. Rather right. be what's, dead in a ditch. What's a ditch? Than to grant another extension. What's, a ditch is a trench. It's um, you know a water filled uh, you know thing beside the road. Yeah. Um, so you don't want to. Yeah. If you if you don't want to be dead in the ditch, if you get killed on the road or something, <laughs> you, you'd fall over and roll into the ditch at the side That's of the road. That's right. So I'd rather be dead in a ditch than ask for an extension. So in the end, he, he did said. ask for an extension, of course. Yeah. And um, the uh, the way he got round it was that he wrote a letter but didn't sign it. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so wait a minute. Oh, in, in, in order to get an extension, what does what did Boris Johnson have to do, sort of, you know, in terms of all the constitutional... Well, for, he formally asked the, uh, the European Union, mainly the, uh, the uh, Donald Tusk, who represents the other member states, um, can, can we extend it again while we sort ourselves out? And, of course, they don't want a no-deal Brexit either. It would damage uh, a lot of countries that trade with the UK. Mm. So, of course, they would ex- grant an, yet another extension. So even though he'd said he would never ask for another extension, he did. Um, he just didn't sign the letter, which I thought was hilarious. Does that, I mean, and, 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 uh, and, yes, we are now um, have an extension until the 31st of January next year. Okay. Right. So and, I, I, and, and the reason, you know, that he had to have an extension right. was that the House of Commons has got to agree his newly negotiated deal, the same problem that Theresa May had, and um, he uh, he hasn't got a majority. Uh, he he couldn't pass it in the in the Commons unless the opposition parties actually voted for it. So it's uh, it's it, I mean, this must be so complicated. No, no, no it's all right. It's fine. Listeners. Is it all right? Yeah. The, the thing is about it's about the fact that the House of Commons would not accept a no deal Brexit. OK. And so- what I ought to ought to talk about is the is the suspension of Parliament. We haven't talked about that, have can, we? Can, before we get to that, can we just clarify something that may seem very simple, but I think is important, and that is just the, the sort of the importance of uh, Parliament. Let's say the House of Commons, um, which is obviously where all of the MPs that represent constituencies in, around the country sit. And you talked about the importance of a majority. Let's say for the well for the government, obviously. Just to tell us something about the importance of having a majority in the House of Commons if you're in the government, and Boris, and the fact that Johnson doesn't have a majority. Yes, there are 650 um, seats in the House of Commons representing all the constituencies. Uh, our population is uh, somewhere in the region of 67 million, and um, the uh, therefore the simple mathematics is that if the government uh, can get uh, 325 votes, Mm -hmm. 326 votes, uh, then the opposition combined can't stop them uh, introducing laws. They can get 326 seats, in effect, because each seat is contested in different constituencies. That's right. And they need... If the Conservatives won 326 seats, they would have a clear majority. Right. In actual fact, they don't quite need that many because Sinn Féin, the Republicans in, uh, in Northern Ireland, um, refuse to recognise the Westminster government and they never take up their seats even though they get elected. So it's just slightly less than that number. Okay. Anyway, that's a detail. The, the, the fact is that he's f- well short of it uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that as we were plunging towards a no-deal Brexit, mm-hmm. quite a few MPs left the Conservative Party because yeah. they, uh, they couldn't accept that. They couldn't sign up to that. Some of them joined the Lib Dems, the the uh, centrist anti-Brexit party. Some of them uh, formed, became independents, if you like. Yeah. Uh, also, Labour lost a few members as well um, uh, because they were dissatisfied with the stance of the Labour Party. Uh, so the two main parties, was, which have been very divided right from the beginning of this process internally, yeah. were starting to fracture. Um 
so so there's Boris Johnson unable to pass any legislation. He had, I think, he had eleven votes uh, since he became prime minister and lost them all because you know having a majority means that all of the members of your party will vote, I suppose, to support your position. And so having a majority means that, you, you know, you just have so much more power, right? Uh, but, I mean, if Boris Johnson had a majority, would all of the MPs vote in support of him? You know, because, you know, we talked about the, the parties there, both there being... There were one or two rebels, but, but yeah. um, most of the time the, the uh, party members will vote with their, with their government um, on the, most issues. The whip is a is a word that people yes, might read or people hear. people may have heard about that. Yeah, but, it's one of the old positions in the Palace of Westminster, the Houses of Parliament, of course, has great history. And the whips are the p- party uh, police. <laughs> yeah. The party member uh, officials who uh, instruct their party members on what to vote and how to vote on certain issues. So basically using the whip, Boris would make sure that uh, if he had a majority, those MPs would, would back him. In yes, a, in the, yeah. the, the, the whips are, are people who um, are, are feared because they can ruin your career if you don't fall into line. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, all right. That, but Boris Johnson doesn't have a majority, as, you, as you've just been saying. Mm-hmm. And so he, so what he suggested was that well, let's have a general election then. Uh, now the Labour Party would have been of a problem here because um, the Conservatives are ahead in the opinion polls. Um, Labour have always been saying they want an election, they want an election, and they had a difficulty because the the Prime Minister was, if you like, caught uh, on a on a pin. He was pinned to the wall, if you like, because yeah. he he didn't have a majority. He couldn't get anything done, and he was starting to look very weak. And they didn't weren't quite entirely sure whether they actually wanted a general election right now. Mm. But uh, they were they were bounced into it because the other parties, the Scottish National Party and the Liberal Democrats notably, said, yes, bring it on, we would vote for an election. So Labour felt they had to uh, fall into line. Yeah. So the only vote Boris Johnson won was calling for a general election. I see. Okay. And that will happen on December the 10th. Right, so now we're in a situation where it's kind of like Parliament being reset in order to try and have another go, isn't it? Yes, as we speak, uh, all the MPs have stopped being MPs. They are now candidates in their own constituencies. Government is uh, on ice and um, we are into an election campaign. It's the first time there's been a a winter, a December election campaign for very many years. Um, It's unusual because it, it does rather affect the outcome. It may mean if the weather's bad that the number of people who vote will be down especially in the it north may mean older people yes especially in the north it may mean older people are disinclined to go out in the dark and vote and so on and so on um and campaigning is more difficult if the weather's bad yeah. so uh, they normally avoid um the you know, winter time for an election but this time well there, there isn't time to mess about uh, so boris johnson has got his election and the reason he's going for it is because he wants to get a majority Do you and think- if he gets a majority then he will pass his brexit deal and we will be out uh, by january the 20 january the 31st sorry right okay so, so here we are then <laughs> now it's a general election Yes. Okay. So again, before we get to Brexit, okay, this general election. All right. Well, let's talk about that a bit, shall we? What, what's going to happen then? What do you think? <laughs> oh dear. Well, all all the commentators are are saying this is one of the most difficult elections to predict uh, for a very long time. Uh, in fact, possibly the most difficult to predict. Um, this is because um, the the electorate. Uh, are are becoming more volatile. Um, in, instead of the always sticking sticking the people who vote, uh, yeah. instead of sticking to their traditional loyalties, party loyalties, um, the the one thing that's changed and upset that is the Brexit referendum of 2016. Mm-hmm. So David Cameron sort of threw a grenade into this into the arena. Let's say he put a spanner in the works. Put a spanner in the works. Whatever you want to use, whatever analogy you want to use, but it, it certainly upset the apple cart. There's <laughs> another expression for you. Um, 
the the uh, so a lot of people are saying, well, uh, I don't want to vote for my traditional party because I don't agree with their stance on Brexit. Mm. Um, and uh, the the opinion polls still show uh, the Conservatives ahead of Labour. Yes. Um, so at the moment, as we speak, they are on course to get that majority. And therefore, we would leave the EU um, early next year. But nobody's quite sure. And uh, the Scottish National Party are sure to do well in Scotland. So the, the Conservatives might almost be wiped out there. So the Scottish um, National Party are kind of le- a, a sort of left-wing party, aren't they? Yeah, that- a pretty socialist party, socialist yeah. party, but of course they want independence for Scotland. And that uh, has been boosted by the idea that uh, we, we, the United Kingdom, are going to leave the EU. Scotland voted very strongly to remain in the EU. Yeah. Uh, and so they say, well, it, you know, if London is going to drag us out of the European Union against our will, we'll go independent and we'll apply to join the EU. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so that's SNP. The that's SNP. Scotland. The Liberal Democrats are the strongest anti-Brexit party. Uh, they basically say, if we uh, come to power, we will cancel Brexit. It, we will we'll just cancel it and say, that's it. Uh, it's the only way to stop this nonsense, uh, stop this pain and get back to some reasonable government. And they believe passionately that we should be in the EU. Uh, the the deal we have as members of the EU is so much better than Boris Johnson's strange, mysterious deal that he's going to um, put forward if he wins the election. The argument that you hear from Brexiters, um, or just you know, in response to the idea that we just cancel Brexit, they say that uh, you know the people have spoken. Um, leave means leave, and it would and that it would be undemocratic to just call the whole thing off. They certainly do, uh, and of course that's that's the the what we've been hearing for the last three years from the uh, the the Brexit side. It's well, you know, we voted to leave, so why don't we just leave? You know, it's like a football game. We won, get over it. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it's not a football game, and there's a whole bunch of reasons uh, why the result of the referendum has huge question marks over it. And the main thing, of course, is that people in the know don't think leaving the EU is a good idea. So you have a have a big problem that the referendum produced a result which all the institutions of the country don't agree with. Right. And in fact, a result which is... I was thinking about this the other day. The, the, the Perhaps the crucial thing, the, the crucial problem here is uh, when David Cameron called the uh, referendum. And it, it, it was a choice a binary choice between two things which uh, are not equivalent or were never equivalent, so a false equivalency, um, that basically it's kind of like you can choose to remain, which is where every single detail of the situation is defined, right? We know exactly what remaining means. Yeah, or free, we have free movement of people, yeah, goods, all, services, all of it. It's all commi- it's all it's all written down. It's all in laws and et cetera, treaties et and the, the so whole thing. Is. Or we have um, you know to leave, which is a completely undefined co- thing. It is sort of a vacuum in terms of concrete information. And there, nope, there and are, there's no, no precedent. No one's ever done it. Exactly, before. no precedent, and uh, many a rainbow of different versions of Brexit. Right. People were voting for something, voting for a sort of, you know, uh, an imagined uh, thing and uh, a thing that is not actually tangible or, or um, uh, you, do you see what I'm getting at? The, the false equivalency. Yes, yes, yes I am. Uh, obviously, we have talked about the referendum on more than one occasion and, and it's now three and a half years ago. Long, long time. Yeah. But it, at the time, uh, you know, people would say, well, leave on what terms and and everyone was deceived they they were given slogans handy slogans which was take back control was the main one mm-hmm. take back control now that's a clever slogan it rather assumes that we've lost control for a start yeah and take back control of our borders that's you know immigration yeah. take back control of our laws this rather implies that the European Union imposes laws on us against our will. And if you ask anybody, can you name one? They can't. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it suggests that Germany, Italy, France, Spain, and all the rest of them somehow have lost control. Uh, and, and people bought this, that, that we would have a wonderful independent future and we would strike trade deals with countries around the world, particularly you know, USA, and we would be released from the shackles of the EU. And uh, this, this, this kind of uh, invective or hyper- hyperbole convinced a lot of people who were unhappy. They were, it was the poorer regions that voted to leave the EU. Um, they just wanted to vote against Cameron, against the institutions, against anybody who was telling them what to do. Right. Okay. And another thing to add, obviously, is that the, the referendum result was uh, always advisory. Uh, it wasn't, yes, no, it wasn't binding at all. No, it had no legal force. But the fact is that um, it, it did produce a narrow victory for leaving the EU, and yeah. it would be... Uh, it is very divisive. If we cancelled Brexit, it would remain as a divisive issue. Um, but I don't think it's um, something that w- we sh- we should say, oh, well, we voted for it, therefore we have to do it, even though it's going to be bad for us. That's yeah. absolutely insane. It's like- uh, it's interesting that one of the most vocal members of parliament who is in favour of Brexit yeah. is, a, is a man called Marc Francois. Okay, it, ironic that he's got a French type name. Yeah. And, um, he said, uh, as the deadline approached at, at the end of October, if we don't leave on the 31st of October, the UK will explode. <laughs> um, well, well it hasn't exploded threat? yet. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a kind of a threat of violence, isn't it? A little bit. Don't yeah. you think? Yeah. Um, but it hasn't exploded yet. And uh, I don't believe that if um, if there was a, a, a government that cancelled Brexit, it would explode. Um, but the more likely scenario is that uh, if the Conservatives don't win an outright, outright majority, it could be possible for the opposition parties to get together and force a second referendum. Okay. Um, so that might be a mechanism by which... Uh, we we actually vote this time or next time mm-hmm. that uh, Bre- maybe Brexit isn't such a good idea. Um, we've been sort of going through the parties, I think. We talked about SNP, we talked about Liberal Democrats and the fact that they'd like to cancel Brexit altogether. Um, others, I mean, have we've mentioned Labour a bit, um, I think, and Tories and how they sort of, you know, they're a bit divided. Um, uh, there are other significant parties. I mean, the Brexit Party, for example, um, fairly big news in the last couple of days regarding the Brexit Party, because they were going to be a problem for the Tories, that potentially they, uh, if there was a Brexit Party candidate um, uh, running for a seat um, uh, in competition with a Tory candidate, that that might split the Tory vote. Um, but what's happened? What's Nigel Farage um, said recently? Y- yes, it is significant. Um, interestingly, the Brexit Party doesn't have any MPs, mm-hmm. does it? I don't think it does. No, it doesn't. Um, it has MEPs, the European Parliament. Ironic, isn't um, it? <laughs> yes, isn't it just? Um, and um, But they have been very influential in recent events. It was the rise of UKIP, that's the UK Independence Party, which has turned into Bre- the Brexit Party recently. It was the rise of UKIP that forced Cameron to have the election because he didn't like the fact that former Conservative voters were starting to support this um, party with one policy only, leave the EU. Yeah. Um, so now UKIP have turned into Brexit. The, Nigel Farage is their... Another is French their name. ...leader, another one. And um, uh, Farage is a disreputable character in my view, um, and I'm not alone in that. Uh, disreputable character disreputable character i think he is dishonest and um we, we're not entirely sure where his funding comes from but i don't think it comes from this country mm-hmm. uh farage uh, a week ago announced with great fervor that they were going to contest every seat in the land they would field more than 600 candidates the brexit party is on the march and all that kind of thing and of course, um, people were wondering how on earth they could afford to do that. Yeah. And he was offering a pact with the Conservatives at the same time, saying, tell you what, why don't we do a deal 
Um, and uh, I suppose that deal would be we work together um, so that where we have the best chance of winning a seat, you stand your candidate down and vice versa. And the payoff would be we uh, we get some seats in government if you get there. Well, the, the, none of this is spelled out, but that's yeah. what it means. But it, the, and, it, it would involve, sorry, it would involve some kind of like a um, coalition or confidence and supply arrangement. Yes, it would. Yeah. And of course, Boris Johnson rejected that notion immediately because he, I mean, you know, doesn't want to be associated with the extreme views of Farage and co, but also, um, they, they want to win outright themselves. So within days, Farage announced, Oh, well, actually, we're not going to contest all 600 seats. Uh, we're not going to run against the Conservatives in the 317 constituencies that they won in the election two years ago. So it's a complete U-turn. Why has he done that? Fuss. He's done that, first of all, because they can't afford it um, to to uh, run all these candidates do you, do you know that sorry um, do you know that he's been uh, the brexit party has been sort of um what like uh interviewing auditioning candidates and the candidates themselves have to put up a hundred pounds in order to be sort of registered as a potential candidate for the brexit party so they're all paying their hundred pounds in order to get what was it 600 or something and um and now Farage has said, so actually, no, not, no, we're not going to do that anymore. Yes, so they're and being told, well, thanks very much, but we're not going to have all that money. Is he going to give them their money back? No, he was he asked is- that on the radio yesterday. He says, no, of course not. Okay. Um, so so they, I don't think they could afford it, but also um, they they wouldn't win. Uh, and and uh, it's true that uh, if he split the vote between um, uh, people who want Brexit – uh, in seats where the Conservatives are there, he might take enough votes away from the Conservatives to allow perhaps the Liberal Democrats or Labour to win the seat. Mm. So as someone who wants Brexit above all things, um, maybe it's not such a good idea to compete against the Conservatives who are committed, uh, at least at number 10 Downing Street, are committed to leaving the EU. So... Um, he, they will be competing against Labour and the Lib Dems, who would probably, well, as far as Labour's concerned, we think that they would campaign to remain in a, in a, a second referendum. It's a bit of a problem with Labour, though, isn't it? We, yes, yeah. it is a big problem. We haven't mentioned the leaders. Leaders are very important in general elections. I know it's not a presidential election, but, they, but they're but they always important. Mm. People say, oh, I don't, I don't like that person. I'm not going to vote for them. Uh, and uh, the problem Labour have got is that Jeremy Corbyn is generally unpopular. Uh, he has his support, uh, on, the, on the left of the party, he has really quite strong support. But generally speaking, um, his popularity rating is much lower than Boris Johnson's, which is quite an achievement since Boris Johnson is, is so untrustworthy and uh, has, uh, you know, misled people so many times. And that's that's overtly acknowledged, isn't it? The the, the lies and the mistruths. Well, and yeah. So you, your listeners will know that I'm no fan of Boris Johnson. And that, um, but I just wanted know, to say that because it's not a que- not just a question of opinion. That, no, that- it's not. It, it, it is obviously that that he was uh, leading the um, m- misinformation during the referendum campaign, and uh, even since he's become prime minister, he has been misleading people over a number of things. It's quite interesting that there is a big report about external interference in. Uh, Referendum and election. External interference. Yes, yeah. s- sitting on um, th- his desk. So, so sorry. Uh, and this external interference, we're talking about things like um, somehow like elections being influenced um, externally from from some other country. From other other countries, yes. Yeah. And um, I mean, your your Russian listeners won't like uh, you know Russia being mentioned, but the um, the information that is. Uh, around already about this parliamentary report which was a very thorough uh, look at whether foreign influence had had played a part in the referendum and the last election um the, the, one of the things is that the conservative party received very large sums of money from i think 10 uh, senior 
uh, or sorry, Russian businessmen who are all very, very close to the Kremlin. Now, it's not illegal, but uh, it, it wasn't declared. And um, one wonders why people like that would, uh, I mean, we talk about significant sums, up to a million pounds, why they would fund the Conservative Party uh, who were campaigning to leave the EU. Uh, and the question, obviously, is, well, uh, you know, why, why would they? Mm. And you can jump to your own conclusions. The, the, but that's not the only thing. Apparently, the report has covered potential cyber attacks, a whole number of uh, ways that the democratic process may have been uh, affected. This report was completed in March. It was cleared by the security services in October. And conventionally, such reports are with the prime minister for up to two weeks before they release it. But uh, Boris Johnson has simply uh, refused point blank says it's it's uh, not an appropriate time to release this thing <laughs> now if you say well if if it if it is damaging to the conservative party he would suppress it if it's not damaging to the conservative party he would release it so um we have to assume that it's damaging to the conservative party and he's suppressing it so it's basically like uh, okay there's a report on my desk which is all about how potentially my campaign was you know illegally funded or or subject to very dodgy forces let's say uh, but now i'm going to wait until i've been elected prime minister before i release that yes so there's all sorts of things that i don't agree with uh, I'm not the only one. A lot of commentators are outraged. One of them, the former attorney general, the former senior lawyer in the land. And, of course, we haven't mentioned the fact that Boris Johnson and his supporters tried to suspend Parliament. Yes. Uh, when when they were faced with the idea that Parliament would vote against a no-deal Brexit. So the, the parliamentarians, uh, who have a strong majority saying it would be a disaster for the country if we left the EU with no deal, they were lining up to uh, pass a motion that says a no deal Brexit will be illegal. You can't leave without a deal. Because it would be okay? too, too damaging. Too damaging. Yeah. And so the answer to that was that Boris Johnson sent his senior people up to the Queen, who was residing in Scotland at her little castle in Balmoral. Little, and they said, little, um, little castle. We, Sorry. we need, it is a small castle. Is it? Uh, we, <laughs> yes, it's not a big one like Windsor. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, that they say, oh, Her Majesty, we, we need to prorogue Parliament, which is basically suspend it because we uh, need to put together our budget and spending plans uh, for the coming years and uh, we need a little bit of time. So we, we're, we're asking you to suspend Parliament in advance of what's called the Queen's Speech, which is when the government lays out its, uh, its plans. Mm. Uh, now, she signed this thing. They uh, said she- Parliament is now suspended – uh, pe- the parliamentarians are all told it- it's closed for five weeks. Okay, so wait, five wait, weeks. Just one question: When did this happen? Oh dear! This this was September, wasn't it? September, right? Facing uh, facing uh, Brexit Day on the thirty first of October, and Boris is going. Right. Okay, we're going to close down it, well, the Houses you know, of Parliament it, for five weeks. That's right. It was very much afraid that the that you know the MPs would stop him. Uh, you know, bringing us out of the EU uh, on the deadline day of October the 31st, come what may. With no deal. So the answer was, uh, we'll just suspend Parliament. This is extraordinary stuff. I mean, we are a parliamentary democracy and have been for hundreds of years. And now we had this, uh, his um, special advisor, Dominic Cummings, who is the man who is the great tactician uh, for Boris Johnson, saying, um, well, this is about the people versus the Parliament. How about that? People versus so it's the Parliament. The people versus the Parliament. So he's basically saying, you know, parliamentary democracy is is defunct and uh, we'll now rule by referendum. I don't know what he meant. But uh, immediately people went to the courts. There were, there were two directions. One was to a Scottish court uh, and the other one was to the High Court in London. 
saying this suspension of parliament is unprecedented, uh, them saying that it's just so that they have enough time to put their program of laws together is a specious, it's not true. And the real reason is to prevent parliament doing its job. And it went to the Supreme Court, mm. Supreme Court in London, and they had a full meeting of the Supreme Court, all the judges, there are 11 of them. And if they all sit together, the reason it's 11 and not 12 is that you can't have a draw. Yeah. That if, if they, you know, a majority of judges makes a decision, that's the decision. So the 11 judges considered what had been passed on to them from the High Court. Was this suspension of Parliament legal or was it not legal? And uh, there was great interest here as we went live to the Supreme Court and the woman who was the chairman of the judges, the senior one, Uh, read out their verdict live on television. And the moment she said, this is a unanimous verdict of all 11 of us, we pretty well knew which way it was going to go. And her judgment was was devastating. Said It was clearly untrue that they were doing something that was was, uh, routine. It was clearly untrue that the reason was that they needed lots of time to prepare the Queen's speech. And it is clearly the reason that they wanted to stop Parliament preventing them what they wanted to do. And in those terms, it was illegal. It didn't happen. They say the prerogative problem was null and void. It didn't actually happen. And, of course, it meant that uh, Boris Johnson's people had lied to the Queen – (laughs) <laughs> they had lied about why they were doing it, and had and that it was routine and and you know, uh, ob- obviously perfectly innocent, and um, so, so so this is the government I'm talking about. This is the Boris Johnson I'm talking about. This is the this is the Boris Johnson who has been campaigning to leave the EU in order to reclaim our British sovereignty, and there he is lying to the Queen. Well, it's some pretty amazing stuff. Anyway, uh, so. So the, the Parliament returned, promptly passed a law banning uh, an odial Brexit. <laughs> Boris Johnson's people indicated that he wouldn't abide by that law. What? Uh, well, they they said he will abide by the law, but we'll leave on October the 31st. So people said, well, wait a minute, the Parliament has just voted that you can't leave without a deal on October the 31st. Well, he'll abide by the law, but we'll leave on October the 31st. <laughs> so, So this was obviously... Uh, which is it? Uh, and um, it was indicated that he would sit tight uh, in Downing Street uh, and, uh, you know, you do your worst. I'll what? Pull, you out, pull us out of the EU. Well, it's indicated by, you know, Downing Street sources that um, we would just leave the EU. That, that even though a law had been passed. Even though a law had been passed, so we can't leave without a deal. They, they were indicating that he might just ignore so it. So what is that? Is that a coup? Is that a political uh, coup? It, it, it would have been the biggest constitutional crisis since they cut Charles' first head off. Yeah. And, and um, of course, it's these rumours uh, were just rumours because in the end, uh, he wasn't dead in a ditch. He asked for an extension and uh, managed to persuade everybody that he'd done a deal. Um, so... Uh, interesting episode that the suspension of Parliament episode was shocking, really. Yeah. And they didn't get away with it. They didn't. Right. Uh, we, you know, we have law courts that uphold, um, you know, the right thing to do. And I'm glad to say that the Supreme Court uh, basically wouldn't accept that uh, this five-week suspension uh, was ordinary, uh, routine, and was done for the reasons they said it was being done for. Why, why, are, they, why are they looking for no deal? Why, you know, why this sneaky attempt to p- pull us out of Europe um, illegally without a deal. What, what do they want no deal for? It's obviously a terrible idea. They just think that um, it's gone on too long and that um, the uh, the people who say we voted to leave, let's just leave, are very influential. Um, so so they're playing to them. It's more about grabbing power. And he's still doing it. The, the main election campaign mantra at the moment is let's get Brexit done. So he's say everyone's sick and tired of this process. So Boris Johnson's going around and saying, vote for us and we'll get Brexit done. You know, within weeks, we'll get Brexit done. Don't ask us how. Well, well, so, don't actually, ask us what it's actually going to look like, well, but we'll actually, get it well, done. <laughs> but it won't get done. This is just the first phase. If he, if he manages to pass his deal and we do leave 
uh, by the end of January next year. That's just the first part of it. We then go into a transition period where we're still in the EU without any MEPs and without any seats at the table. And we're negotiating for position of weakness, by the way, our future relationship with the EU on many fronts, but particularly on trade. Uh, and that's going to go on for the best part of two years. This, you know, this is not going to get Brexit done. This is just the beginning of the beginning. Oh my so, um, so appealing to people to say, you're fed up with all this, let's get Brexit done, and then we can get on with the real issues of the country. It's actually a little bit specious. The the other thing in the election campaign, Luke, is that the health service is, is right up there as an issue. So Brexit is divisive and it's confusing things. But the NHS, the National Health Service of the UK, is right up there on the election agenda. And, um, uh, I mean, I, I would ask you, what are the Tories promising regarding the NHS? Both the main parties are, are promising huge investment in the NHS. OK. So it's now become a kind of um, a bidding war, or, or if you like, a kind of arms race to see who can promise more for the NHS. And and the critics are pointing at the Tories and saying, you're lying, you're not going to invest that much. And the critics are pointing to Labour and saying, it's impossible to spend that much because, they're, they're, you know, where's the money going to come from? How are you going to afford it? Yes. Uh, it, it's the usual stuff. Um, you know, the Conservatives always accuse Labour of being irresponsible. And Labour will point to the fact that the Conservatives have been in power for a decade. During that decade, the real spend on the health service has not kept pace with inflation but also the demands on the health service have have shot up it mainly because there are so many older people now older and sicker people requiring treatment so the the result of that in recent years especially in winter time has been um hospitals at breaking point uh, with ambulances queuing up outside and no available doctors or beds uh, so they could be unloaded. Um, People on trolleys in corridors and hospitals because there aren't enough beds. General practice, which is very, very big election issue, which is when you go to your doctor, Mm. um, your local doctor, there are not enough doctors. There are not enough nurses. And the all the targets that uh, they had set in years gone by have been breached, not only at the hospitals, but in your in your local doctors. You can't get an appointment. If you do get an appointment, it takes ages for your knee operation to be scheduled. It might get cancelled because the hospital is overloaded. And this is, this is the Tories' solution to bro- fixing broken Britain well, is to well, just uh, stop spending it's, money it's, on it. it. It it does suddenly. We have an election and suddenly the Conservatives are saying we're going to spend £20 billion over the next five years fixing the NHS. Well, who do you believe? The the Labour Party invented the NHS just after the Second World War. They've always been huge supporters of the NHS. When Tony Blair was was Prime Minister, uh, they managed to increase taxes to a certain extent and funnel the money into the NHS and they met their targets. All these targets were things like ambulance response time, uh, waiting time in emergency departments and hospitals, how long it takes to get an appointment with your doctor, uh, various other targets, and uh, they were all met. So it, it is extraordinary now that the Conservatives are promising the earth on building new hospitals and recruiting new doctors. I like that one. We're going to recruit, I think they said, 6,000 more general practitioners. From? Hmm. How are they going to do that? Where are they going to come from? Well, well, it takes the best part of 10 years for somebody to be qualified to be a GP. Yeah. It's it, in some cases a bit less, but it tends to be five years in college in medical school and then five years as a junior doctor learning the trade before you could be let loose on the public. (laughs) So uh, uh, how they're going to magic up thousands of doctors, goodness only knows. And of course, Brexit hasn't been entirely unhelpful because a lot of um, doctors and nurses and other support staff from the EU 
have decided that maybe they don't want to come and work in UK after all. And it's a very significant number who are, well, the, the numbers of people coming has dropped. I don't think there's any evidence that everybody's leaving. Yeah. But the number of people applying to, to work for the NHS has dropped. We're talking about people from Holland, Germany, Spain, a lot of, we're quite a lot of doctors from Spain. So Brexit is entirely unhelpful in this. But the NHS is a very big issue. Mm. Whether it will be big enough for Labour to uh, to win this election or at least hold the balance of power, um, I don't know. Um, because, as we said before, Jeremy Corbyn is not particularly popular. Any predictions then? Uh, if I had to predict now, and I remember all sorts of unexpected things happen in election campaigns, you never know what's going to happen next. Yeah. You know, they, they might suddenly reveal that um, one of the leading figures is a criminal. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? If I had to predict now, I would say that the Conservatives will win an overall majority. Okay, and then they'll, then they'll basically push... They'll pass their deal and we will technically have to leave the EU. Yeah. I don't want that to happen, but you're asking me what I think is the most likely. Well, I think that's probably it. Yeah, okay. But I'm a pessimist. Last time we were talking, I thought the most likely outcome was a no-deal Brexit. Well, at least that seems to be off the table. Yeah, sort of like a goalkeeper, sort of dramatic goalkeeper save at the end, <laughs> it was. Right. Because like, the ball was dribbling to, into the net and the goalie managed to, like, you know, leap across the touchline and just sort of uh, palm it around the corner. That's right. Anyway, there you go. So we've got an election campaign to look forward to uh, on December the 12th. And uh, nobody really knows what's going to happen. It's going to be interesting to see. OK, finally, then, uh, football. I mean, ah, uh, yes, yeah, football. So what about the premiership? Oh, it's, it's really, really good. You may recall that I support Liverpool. Yeah. And um, uh, of course, they're top of the Premier League and they haven't won the Premier League for quite a long time. Uh, and the fans are getting quite excited. So, and and the holders of the title are Manchester City, who won the last two years running, and they were absolutely brilliant. Uh, so uh, last weekend we had Liverpool at home at Anfield against Manchester City. We, and Wee. it was a fantastic game. Two dazzling, dazzling teams. This, the pace of the game was extraordinary, and it's nice, controversial, and usual things. Uh, but Liverpool won three one. Yay. Uh, the Liverpool haven't won uh, the, the Premiership, the Premier League, since uh, the 1989-1990 season. Yeah, there you go. So nearly, what, 30 years? Is that 30 yes. years? It's 30 yes, years, it? it is. It's a long wait for a, a team that's won the European Cup and is a you know great team. They just, just didn't quite get there uh, year after year after year. This might be the year. And um, it, the nice thing is that they, they play such brilliant attacking football. So do Manchester City and Manchester United playing quite well as well. And right up there with them is Leicester City, a smaller club who won the Premier League a few years ago, to much to everyone's amazement. And they're playing terrifically well. So Leicester cannot be ruled out. But you, you fancy Liverpool, do you? I do you? fancy Liverpool. I think they've, they're so brilliant. Uh, they're they're virtually unstoppable. What's this, what? They haven't lost a match for twenty matches. Wow, twenty one something yeah, like that. That's that's impressive. What's mm. the what do you think? What's the key to the success at the moment? I think it's it's partly uh, Jurgen Klopp, their charismatic manager, yeah, um, who is an amazing character and he's got a terrific record. I mean, when he was in. Germany, you know, he was winning the Bundesliga with Dortmund and people like that. Uh, but also, they just happen to have a great blend of players. And, and the three up front are just incredible together. Mane and uh, Salah and Firmino, uh, they, they are so difficult to stop. It's great to watch. Um, what's coming up this weekend? Can't remember. Um, I have a quick look. I did catch some of the, uh, the Man City game. Um, so hold on, Premier. Hold on, I can edit these. I was watching the game in a pub. Me too. And it was great. I was sitting there in front of a big screen um, and watching this uh, this extraordinary game, which which was so fast, it was just breathtaking. Yeah. It looks like at the weekend there's no Premier League. Is it FA Cup? It must be. Uh, or internationals or something, but uh, it looks like... Oh, the yes, it's internationals, yeah. 
Is it I World think, Cup? Uh, yes, I think I think it's the Euros, Euro qualifiers. Euro qualifiers. Where where do we stand on that at the moment? I do think you know? we're at the top of our top of our group. We're at the top of our group, are we? Who are we yeah. up against? <laughs> Which it, Titans uh, on, are we up against? On Saturday, that? we're going to play away at Kosovo. Ooh. Um, yeah. So it, it, that's a a difficult place to go. Is it? I mean, I've been I've been there, Pristina. Yes. Mm. Um, I, I I'm. You know, they are very passionate about their football uh, and uh, it's a hostile environment. So, but uh, England ought to be able to beat Kosovo. Yeah, you'd have thought so. Mm. All right. Uh, But the Premier League uh, match week 13 is Saturday, the 23rd of uh, November. Tottenham versus West Ham. Arsenal, Southampton. Who else? I'm just looking for the big clubs. Leicester versus BHA. Uh, Brighton and Hove Albion yeah. uh, Liverpool versus Crystal Palace oh well which should be a shoe in for Liverpool it should be should be um, we've got Man City versus Chelsea oh that's a big game oh good one Sunday we've got um, who's that Sheffield United versus Man United On I didn't s- mention Chelsea Chelsea are also having a very good season yeah a uh, very good season and they've got this manager who used to play for them for many years Beth. and uh, played for England Frank Lampard Chelsea are actually He's, third in the in the table yeah, at the moment. yeah Frank Lampard is turning out to be a very good manager is he their manager yeah oh really yeah. I didn't know that um, Liverpool first uh, way ahead with um, well way ahead eight points ahead of Leicester in second position followed by Chelsea Man, Man City and then Sheffield United yeah they're playing very well too that's a surprise where did they come from? Well, well Sheffield. Underwater. Underwater at the moment. Uh, yeah, Sheffield's really. underwater. Okay. Well, listen, um, Dad, can I just say on behalf of my listeners uh, a very sincere thank you for, you know, bringing your clarity to the it, subject? It is my pleasure to join you on the podcast. I hope they, they enjoy listening to a bit of English being talked. Uh, I'm sorry if the Brexit saga is a bit uh, complicated and a bit tedious, um, but you did ask. <laughs> they did ask. Yes, they did. Every, I get regular uh, yes, requests for the next episode of the of the report. Um, okay, listeners, nice one. You, obviously, you can get in the comments section and leave your thoughts and questions and things there. But uh, once again, Dad, thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day. Okay, it's a pleasure. Same to you. Okay, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. So there you have it. That was the Rick Thompson Report recorded on Wednesday the 13th of November 2019. The comment section is open if you'd like to share your thoughts there. Um, What else do I have to tell you? New episodes of LEP Premium are coming. Uh, To sign up to the premium service, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium. So new episodes coming soon. I'm working on some content. Also, I've been uploading regular little pronunciation videos where I do some pronunciation drills with the sentences written on the screen for you with little features of connected speech and sentence stress highlighted. You can get all of that stuff in the premium um, section. Also, if you haven't already done so, you could download my app. Just go to the App Store on your phone and search for Luke's English Podcast app. Do that to get the entire archive plus loads of bonus extras like the Phrasal Verb series, various videos, and also uh, bonus app-only episodes. Uh, You can also access the premium subscription through the app. So I like to think that the app is like the home for Luke's English podcast on your phone, and you can get it free from the App Store. Um, That's it then. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast, and I will speak to you again soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.